So this isn't Russell's main focus in the paper, though, though he does talk about it a bit. But I want to also relate back so this view to problems about names that we've been talking in previous lectures. So remember, the view under consideration is that really most names work like descriptions. Most names that we use, the meaning of that is just whatever description we use to think about the object. Because most things that we're able to talk about, most things whose name we know, we're not acquainted with. That view, it turns out, is really, really can actually help us make sense of some of the puzzles that we talked about, particularly when we were talking about Frege. Because remember, when we talked about just descriptions last week, Russell talked about a bunch of puzzles that were supposed to motivate the view. So there's the puzzle about informativity, the puzzle of non-existence. And it was pretty clear that those puzzles were very similar to the ones that Frege was talking about. Once you notice this similarity, it's obvious to ask yourself, well, could Russell's theory of descriptions somehow help us understand what's going on with Frege's problem? And indeed, there is a way. Because if once we start saying that names are really disguised descriptions, it becomes really easy to say what's going on in both Frege's puzzle and the case of empty names. So we focused on claims like Clark Kent is Superman. And we notice that seems to mean something really different from Clark Kent is Clark Kent. And the question is, well, why would that be, especially if you have a million view of names? Because if you have a million view of names, well, then that means the same thing as that. So the, sol the two sentences should just mean the same thing. But we saw there's lots of reason to think that they don't mean the same thing. This is a hard thing to know. That's an easy thing to know. That's the, sort of main, the main version of the argument. Basically, the idea of the solution here is that both of these names are associated with descriptions. Really, both na names mean descriptions, but they mean different descriptions. So, for instance, Superman, on this view, the meaning of Superman might be something like the guy who flies around in a cape. So what I've just done is I've substituted uh, Superman, I've replaced it with its description, with the description which is supposed to mean the same thing. Uh, what about Clark Kent? Well, we can assume that the meaning of Clark Kent would be something like the reporter who works at the Daily Comet. So we can replace that with the reporter who works at the Daily Comet. And then we could do the same thing in this sentence. I won't write it out in full, but the reporter who dot 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 is the reporter who dot dot dot. So here, this is meant both of these are meant to say the same thing as this description here. Because remember, this is the description which is supposed to give us the meaning of the word, of the, of the name Clark Kent. So I've just replaced both uses of Clark Kent in this sentence with the description. So if you compare what these sentences mean, there's no longer really any puzzle about why they should differ in meaning. What is, so this is the sentence that corresponds to Clark Kent is Clark Kent. It says, the reporter who works at the Daily Comet is the reporter who works at the Daily Comet. That's just a triviality. We don't really need to know anything about the world to know whether that's true or not. What about this one? The reporter who works at the Daily Comet is the guy who flies around at the Cape. Well, this sentence clearly says something very different. I mean, you can see that especially if we think about it through Russell's view of descriptions. So remember what Russell's view of descriptions said. It says basically like that to say that the F is G is to say there's exactly one thing which is F and it's G. Now I won't go through the process of working it out, um, 
But what this sentence will say, basically, on Russell's theory of descriptions, is that there's exactly one guy who is a reporter who works at the Daily Comet, and there's exactly one guy who flies around in a cape, and they're the same guy. So there's exactly one of the guy of this kind, there's exactly one of the guy of this kind, and they are, and those and those those guys are identical. And we can see how that is a non-trivial piece of information. There's a lot of information packed into that claim that clearly isn't packed into that claim. So this idea of associating names with descriptions gives us a really nice way to respond to Frege's puzzle. What's going on is that names are associated with dis descriptions, but two names of the same thing could be associated with different descriptions. So for that reason, like in our example here, replacing Superman with the name Clark Kent can change the meaning because you, can, you could potentially be replacing it with a name associated with a, di a different description. Now the description might actually pick out the same guy, but because it still me is a different description, it means something different, it's going to change the meaning of the sentence, exactly like it changed the meaning of the sentences here. So that's how we might solve Frege's problem, using the idea that names are really descriptions. So take a claim like Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. So you might say, well, this claim is not a true claim. Santa doesn't exist, so he can't, in particular, he can't live at the North Pole. But remember, it was hard to account for that on the million view. Because on the million view, well, if Santa Claus just doesn't exist, well, then this clause doesn't refer to anything at all. But if that doesn't refer to anything, if there's no meaning of this name, then how can the sentence be meaningful? Like, why is that meaningful, but replacing this with a stream of gibberish instead is not? So there was this general question of, well, how can a sentence containing a name for something which doesn't exist, how could that sentence be meaningful if the name just doesn't refer to anything, which it would seem to have to not if Mill were right. If, on the other hand, we say that names pick out descriptions, and we like Russell's theory of descriptions, then we can say exactly what we said last week when we solved the problem of non-existence for descriptions. Because on the description theory of names, what we would say is that the name Santa Claus, it really is just a description in disguise. Um, it would be something like the bearded guy who delivers presents at Christmas. Lives at the North Pole. So if we thought that the name Santa Claus really meant the description, the bearded guy delivers presents at Christmas, that's what this sentence would say. And remember, we also know now what Russell's theory of descriptions says. This would mean the same thing as there is exactly one guy who delivers presents and so on, and he lives at the North Pole. This is quite clearly a meaningful sentence. It's a kind of long-winded way of saying it, but it's quite clear why you'd be saying something meaningful if you said there's exactly one guy who delivers presents at Christmas and he lives at the North Pole. And in particular, you don't need the guy to actually exist in order for that sentence to be meaningful. If Santa doesn't exist, this is still a meaningful claim. It's a false claim because if Santa doesn't exist, well, there's no guy who does that, so there can't be exactly one. But like before, when we thought for exactly the same reasons when we talked about descriptions, there's no, any, there's no longer any problem with saying why the sentence Santa lives at the North Pole is meaningful. The reason is, well, that sentence it really just means the same thing as this sentence, fully spelled out. And that's just a false sentence. It doesn't contain any name that refers to something that doesn't exist, or it doesn't contain any meaningless, meaningless part. All the parts are meaningful, so this sentence, which means the same thing, will have to be meaningful as well.
Now, of course, how much you like that solution is going to depend a little bit on how much you really liked Russell's solution to the problem of non-existence in the first place. And we discussed some reasons for, for not being contented with it. But this is a further possible advantage that you might take the theory to have. So the last thing I'm going to say is something about what this theory is called, because this theory has come to be called the Frege-Russell theory of names. Now it's obvious why it might be called the Russell theory of names, because he basically did endorse something like this theory. Why call it the Frege theory though? Well, one reason why people refer to this as the Frege-Russell theory of names is because you might think that you could actually use descriptions to spell out what Frege had in mind when he talked about sense. So remember, Frege thought that names have both sense and reference. Names refer to things, but that's not all there is to their meaning. They also have this element of sense, which is supposed to be something like a mode of presentation, which picks out the object. We said that idea of like sense and mode of presentation is kind of obscure. It's a bit hard to get your head around what exactly Frege had in mind. But one way people have tried to clarify it, or one version of the theory that people gave later on, was to say, instead of trying to figure out what sense is by thinking about analogies with telescopes and things like that, why not just say the sense is some description? Because descriptions seem to do exactly the thing that Frege had in mind. Remember, the whole point of the sense was to pick out the referent. It was supposed to be like a, a recipe for picking out the referent. But if you think about a description, that seems to be exactly what a description is. So once we have the idea of a description, especially the way of thinking about a description that we got from Russell, we can think about the Fregean picture in a different way. On the original Frege picture, you know, you have a, a name like Mark Twain. That comes associated with a sense which then refers which then refers to you know Mark Twain the person before it wasn't really clear what this sense ingredient was but now the idea is well why not just replace the idea of a of a sense with a description like the author of Huck Finn That seems to get, be getting at the essentials of what Frege was interested in, like the idea that like, there's some sort of intermediate part which refers to the object. But obviously this idea of substituting in a description is a bit clearer, it, it doesn't have quite the same obscurity that Frege, that was in Frege's original presentation. It is important to, to say though that when people talk about the Frege-Russell theory, I mean really this is a name for two different kinds of theories. Because, so this is like the this is like a modified picture of Frege's theory, where we've replaced sense with a reference. But remember for Russell, if he, think, he thinks that descriptions do not refer. He's very clear about that. And he thinks that the meaning of the name is exactly the same as the meaning of the description. So Russell's own picture is a bit different. On Russell's picture, things just look like this. The meaning of the word Mark Twain is just exactly the same as the meaning of the author of Huckfin. So there is a choice we have here. We could say names don't refer at all, they just mean the same thing as descriptions. Or we could say that names do refer, but they're also associated with descriptions. And then you know, on this version of the theory, we would, the explanation we would give of the problem of informant, the explanation of like Frege's puzzle and of non-existence would be more like the one we gave in terms of sense. But the reason why people do think of it as the same theory, as the same theory is because it's just of this really important idea that names are associated with descriptions. This idea seems really important and it seems really promising because clearly the idea that names are associated with descriptions can really help us make sense of what otherwise are very difficult problems. It can help us make sense of Frege's problem. Why can't you always replace one name with another even if they're the name of the same thing? And the problem of non-existence. How can you have names of things that don't exist that are nonetheless meaningful? Whichever way you prefer to state it, 
Maybe you prefer Frege's way, where you have both a description and a reference. Maybe you prefer Russell's way, where all it is is just a description, there's nothing more. Either way, this, this idea that names associated with descriptions seems really promising for fixing some of the problems we had going forward. And so this general idea of associating names with descriptions, that's the thing we'll call the Frege-Russell theory.